Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to our channel and thank you for joining us here again today. Now on this channel we have spoken about the meal side before with the Fun Bradar case and some more but today we are going to talk about another Famille side case and we are going to see from start to end how this case built up to that tragic day and I do just want to give a warning that this case is quite graphic and I do go into a bit of detail so please just be mindful of that when watching or listening to this video. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Debbie McInnes was an incredibly independent and happy child. She knew exactly what she wanted out of life, and she was going to make sure that she got it. Debbie had grown up in Durban with two siblings. She had an older brother named Nigel and a younger brother named Bruce. She lived in a house with her two brothers and her parents, David and Margaret, and she was very close to her family. They would often bounce ideas off each other and they would really want each other's opinion before going to really big steps in their life. So if we fast forward to when Debbie is 23, it seemed like an average, normal, everyday kind of day. And for Debbie McInnes, on the 23rd of November, 1985, this is the day that would change her life entirely. On this day, Debbie was still a few days into her new job working at a very new pharmacy that had just opened up near a shopping complex. So Debbie gets into work, she puts on her lab coat and her name tag, and there's this excitement around the pharmacy because like I said, it's very new, and they are still kind of setting up things in the pharmacy. So Debbie was asked by her boss that morning, to head over to the supermarket next door just to grab some beautiful mugs so that they can have this in their tea room. So Debbie then happily heads over to the supermarket where she then starts looking at the mugs when she then gets a tap on her shoulder. A man then walked up to Debbie and asked her, do you know where the records and tapes are? And Debbie then looked at this man and she's like, I don't work here, I don't know where they are. And then proceeds to grab her mugs and walk away from this man. Debbie assumes that maybe this man asked her in particular because she was wearing a coat and a name tag. So not paying any more mind to this man, she then takes the mugs and she heads back to the pharmacy. Then a couple minutes go by and the phone rings in the pharmacy. One of her colleagues pick it up and they then wave to Debbie to come over. So Debbie then picks up the phone and she's listening and a man is then talking on the phone and he introduces himself as Tony Adlington. The man on the phone then explained that he was the man who just tapped her on the shoulder asking where the records and tapes were. And the reason that he called was that he wanted to ask her out for dinner and get to know her a little better. Debbie was a little bit taken aback and a little bit weirded out by it, but in her mind she was just thinking that she just got out of a really bad relationship and she wasn't exactly ready to get back on the saddle just yet. So Debbie's colleague were then like asking what's happening and Debbie then put her hand on the receiver and she then told her colleagues what happened and they were egging her on to just go on the date to see how things were you never know how things may end so Debbie and Tony set up their date and time for their date and the date continued as normal for Debbie the day came that Debbie and Tony were going on their date and Debbie said that she found Tony incredibly interesting incredibly attractive and their conversation was flowing and what she really liked about him was how intelligent he was and how he could bring up so many different topics of discussion. But Debbie was only 23 and Tony was 32 years old at the time. So there was this nine year age gap that was eating away at Debbie just a little bit. Debbie really liked him, she wanted to talk to him and she wanted to get to know him better. So as the relationship progressed, Tony and Debbie would phone each other every day they would get to know each other better and because they were seeing more of each other Debbie then formed this opinion of Tony and she described Tony while they were dating as very sure of himself he knew what he wanted and she also kind of got the sense that Tony had this his way or the highway kind of attitude so a little bit about Tony Adlington he grew up in Rhodesia and he served in the military there and Rhodesia has now changed its name to Zimbabwe and Tony's parents still stayed in Zimbabwe they never moved to South Africa Tony's father worked as a medical doctor and Tony's mother did some typing some secretarial work but her profession was unclear Debbie would say that Tony described his childhood as a very happy one he had one sister and two half sisters when Tony grew up he studied accountancy and he lived on campus with one of his best friends Robbie Finch and it was said that Robbie and Tony were very close even as they grew older as well so back to Tony and Debbie's relationship they had an absolute whirlwind of a romance they had become very close very quickly and Debbie would often spend most of her time at Tony's flat. 
Then one Christmas, when Tony was back in Zimbabwe visiting his parents, he said to Debbie, you know, you might as well just stay in my flat. I think it's safer. I live in a secure complex, so can you just stay there? And then he kind of also alluded to the fact that maybe she should just stay there permanently, move out of her flat and come and live with him. Debbie was not really keen on this idea because she had a cockatiel that she absolutely loved and Tony hated this bird and he didn't want this bird anywhere near him and she knew that this was just not going to be the right fit. Debbie also didn't want to move into the flat because she felt like it was too soon and she also really wasn't prepared to give up her freedom and her space. But Debbie did think about it and eventually they did end up moving into Tony's flat but on the condition that Debbie could keep her flat so that she could go back and forth and spend time with the cockatiel as well as just having her alone time. But then Tony started to get quite upset that Debbie was moving from her flat to his flat all the time and he wanted her by his flat only. So he said fine the bird can move into the flat but on one condition and that's the condition that this bird never ever leave his cage at all. And I mean shame, poor bird. But then Debbie agreed and she moved her beloved cockatiel into the house with Tony. Then one day when Debbie was out to the shops she came home to an empty bird cage. Debbie was absolutely distraught and she asked Tony, what happened? Where's my cockatiel? Like, what happened to my bird? And Tony just said, oh, I don't know. The bird opened its cage and he then flew out of the window. Debbie was absolutely distraught about her bird. She really, really loved this bird and she wasn't getting any support from Tony. He was just like, get over it. It's just a bird. And she was sad. This was her pet and this was her loved one. And a couple days went by after Debbie's bird flew away and Tony was getting incredibly irritated with her moping around the house. And Debbie decided, okay, it's clearly not helping anyone that I'm moping around. I need to pull myself together for the sake of this relationship. And that's kind of the precedence that would follow Tony and Debbie throughout their relationship. But Debbie would also describe that throughout Tony and her relationship that Tony would make all the decisions. There was no commentary, there was no opinions or anything coming from Debbie that Tony would accept. Tony made all the decisions that he believed would be best for the relationship and Debbie would just have to go with it. In the beginning, she did fight Tony on it because she did have opinions and she did want to be heard. But Tony would listen to her and then just change the subject back to whatever he was talking to or continue the conversation where he thought that he was right and if Debbie would press him on the fact that he kept changing the subject it would end in a massive fight and she just thought that it was not worth it this was not the heel that she wanted to die on and she just completely left it and during the relationship Debbie would not specifically mention any physical abuse but she did say that there was a lot of emotional abuse Tony would always call her name swear at her belittle her make her feel inferior in any circumstance and he would always make sure that he would assert his dominance over Debbie the couple did have dreams of owning their own holiday home in Durban and Tony did start the process of going to architects, talking to everyone about the building plans. And Debbie did want to have a say in her own holiday house. But every time she would bring up anything in front of the architect about what she wanted, Tony would just death stare her and she just eventually retreated. And she would either go sit in the car or she would go find something else to do. Then in February of 1988, Tony told Debbie that he now has a new job in Joburg. And she now needs to pack up and get ready to move. And no, you are kidding yourself if you're thinking that he actually asked Debbie. No, he just told Debbie, you have this amount of time to pack up your stuff, make sure it's ready and we move it to Joburg. However, when Debbie's parents knew that she was going to move to Joburg with Tony, they really tried to persuade her not to do it. They really felt uncomfortable about her moving with him. And also because they lived together unmarried. And Debbie's parents were very set in the way that they need to be married in order to live together. And they kind of accepted it just a little bit while they were under their noses in Durban, but because they're going to now move provinces and they couldn't even see what was happening at all, Debbie's parents wanted to make sure that Tony committed to her at least. But Debbie went with Tony anyway and they then set their life up now in Joburg. Tony then started his work as a financial director for a company and Debbie worked then as a secretary for a company in Joburg. Then, in 1988, Tony and Debbie returned to Durban because they were now going to get married. But then around a year later, they moved back to Joburg because they decided now that they wanted to start a family. So when Debbie fell pregnant with her first child, she said that Tony seemed absolutely excited and ecstatic to become a father. And when she was pregnant, he was very attentive, he was very nurturing for a very small period of time. Tony was not really the smallest of men and he would always make sure that he asserted his dominance over Debbie. So for example, if they got into a fight, he would make sure that he raised his voice the loudest, he approached her 
and stood over her to make her feel small. And for another example, if she was standing I don't know, in a passage and she was not even aware that Tony was there, he would make sure that she knew that he was there. So he would then walk up to her and he would like hit her with his shoulder just to make sure that she knew that he's the boss. Also during their entire marriage, Tony was the only one who managed the money. He knew exactly how much money Debbie earned and he would then want Debbie to transfer or give him every single cent of her salary and then he would dish out how much money she could spend during the month. So he had full financial control over her salary and the household. And if Debbie was to not give him the exact amount that he knew that she got from her salary, then there was hell to pay. But then on the 11th of January 1990, Debbie and Tony had their first child, a baby boy named Kevin. The first thing that Debbie said that she noticed about Kevin was his beautiful strawberry blonde hair. And Debbie said that things were very good with Tony. He was very kind and loving towards his son and he loved being a new dad. But then in 1991, Debbie gave birth to her second child, a daughter named Caitlin. And Tony wasn't exactly thrilled that they had another baby so soon. Caitlin was born on the 29th of August, 1991. But as soon as Caitlin was born, Debbie started to notice changes in Tony. And the change that Debbie noticed the most was that Tony was not keen on Caitlin. He still loved her and he was still a good father, but he wouldn't pick her up. Caitlin wasn't his first child that he would go and kiss and cuddle at all. He would kind of kiss and cuddle her as a second or afterthought. Then with two small babies, Debbie and Tony decided that Debbie should no longer work. She should stay at home with the children instead of them having to pay childminder fees or for the children to go to a crash. Then in 1992, Debbie fell pregnant again. And Tony, to say the least, was incredibly unhappy about this pregnancy. Tony said that he was moving in between jobs and they just didn't have time for a third child. And I mean, you got to kind of take some responsibility when you're doing the dandy. But anyway, their third child arrived on the 1st of December 1992. And their third child was a baby boy named Craig. And as soon as Craig was born, Debbie noticed that Tony was not interested in Craig at all. But obviously as children grow, they all develop different personalities. And Craig was said to be an incredibly gentle, loving and very soft young boy. Kevin, the oldest, he was said to be very charismatic, cheeky, but funny and confident. Not rude at all, just a sweet child. And they also said that Caitlin was a very serious young lady and she wanted everything perfect and pretty, but very serious. But back to when they were babies. Craig was about seven months old when Tony announced that they are moving to Cape Town. So of course, Debbie was not consulted about this moving to Cape Town. They were just told the date that they were moving and that's the end of story. So Debbie had to arrange for her three children, all aged between infant and toddler. She also had to pack everything and then arrange for them all to go to Cape Town. So when Debbie, Tony and the three children arrived in Cape Town, they moved into a house in Constantia. And Constantia is a very affluent suburb. It's a very family oriented suburb. And it's also a safe area to bring up your kids. So Debbie wasn't too mad about the house that they were staying in, but she wasn't very impressed that she's never consulted about anything. So as the children started to grow older, they really wanted a pet, something to love, and specifically a dog. But of course, Tony had to pick exactly what dog they were allowed. So Debbie knew what litter Tony wanted the puppies from. So she took the initiative to grab a puppy and then bring the puppy home to her children. But once Tony got home, he saw that this was not the puppy that he wanted. So he told Debbie to get rid of the puppy, take it back to its litter, and he will then choose the puppy. So they go together, they put the puppy back in the litter, then Tony chooses his one, and then he brings this puppy home, which the children absolutely adore. They love this puppy. And it grows up to be a very happy and welcoming dog in their family. But then as the years grew on, Kevin grew older and Debbie really wanted for him to have his own dog. So Tony and Debbie agreed that they would give him a border collie. But as soon as this border collie puppy entered this house, Tony absolutely hated this dog. And he would make sure that at every turn that he could, he would scare the dog, he would irritate the dog, and he would just make sure that, that the dog's life was unpleasant at the home. And Debbie thought that this is going to end badly. And she decided to take the dog and rehome him, which was probably for the best. So then Tony decided that he's sick of this new job that he has in Cape Town and he wanted to start a new business venture. So he did. He quit his job and he then opened up a coffee shop which he ran with Debbie. Then in 1996, Debbie fell pregnant again and Tony from the get-go said he does not want this child and Debbie needs to get rid of it now. And Tony refused to raise this child. He did not want the baby. Debbie refused and she said that she wants this baby. It's her baby and she's going to keep it. 
but there was constant fighting between Debbie and Tony. They were fighting every single day. And then a couple weeks into her pregnancy, she sadly miscarried. Tony then drove Debbie to the hospital, but he didn't even walk into the hospital with Debbie. He parked at the entrance of the hospital. Debbie then got out in pain and bleeding, and she had to make her way through the hospital without her husband. And he then drove off because apparently he had another appointment. After this incident at the hospital, Debbie then said that Tony became absolutely horrific to live with at home. He was constantly abusive verbally and emotionally. Debbie said that he would do it now in front of the children. He would shout at Debbie in front of the children. And if she really irritated him, he would then walk up to Debbie, raise his hand right in front of her face, but he would never actually slap her. And he just loved the fear that it would bring to her. Debbie thought that maybe this was pressure from the coffee shop because it was not doing as well as he thought it would do. So there was not a lot of money coming in anymore. And Tony would continuously swap one business out for another. There was no stability in terms of the business that Tony was in. He never really seemed satisfied with anything. Then Tony decided to ditch the coffee shop. He sold the coffee shop off and he then bought a real estate franchise. And he said that he was now going to try his hand at real estate while Debbie should get a job at the children's school tuck shop where she can then earn a little bit more income. As a side note, Tony would also play pranks on the kids, which the kids absolutely loved. They really found this funny when their dad would do that. But Debbie would describe one prank that the kids kind of thought was funny, but Debbie felt really uncomfortable about them doing it. And Debbie would describe that Tony would wait for all the children to fall asleep. And in the middle of the night, in the pitch dark outside, Tony would then walk into their rooms very quietly and then he would shake the children awake, he would jump on their beds and he would scream and pretend that something was wrong. And the kids at first were a little bit scared, but then they were kind of like, huh, this is funny. So Debbie just let it happen because she thought that the kids maybe enjoyed it. And then randomly, seemingly out of nowhere, Tony then tells Debbie that she needs to pack up everything he sold the house and we only have X number of weeks now to leave this property. So the few weeks do go by and Tony and Debbie then leave Constantia and they moved to an area called Marina da Gama. And it was at this new house in Marina da Gama where Debbie felt that she had finally had enough. Debbie had just lost one of her closest friends to breast cancer and Debbie was really tired and she was so sad that her husband was not supporting her or not trying to help her in any way. So Debbie did mention to Tony that she actually wanted to leave him and Tony just casually looked up from what he was doing and said, you can leave, but you're not taking the kids with you. And if that was me, I would probably be like, and take the kids. But we have to remember exactly what Debbie had been through. She's been through years of living with this man who has bullied her, emotionally abused her for years. And she was down and she was tired. And she also knew exactly what Tony was capable of. Then from the moment that Debbie said that she wanted to leave Tony, she noticed subtle shifts in Tony's behavior. Like for example, Debbie would wake up in the middle of the night and notice Tony standing at the edge of their bed staring at her. Then when Debbie would ask, what is he doing? He would just say, shush, just go back to sleep. Then a couple of weeks before the horrific incident in December, in the Christmas holidays, Debbie and her three children went up to Durban for a couple of weeks to be with Debbie's parents. Tony refused to come, saying that he had work stuff to do, which I'm sure Debbie and the children didn't mind. But Tony would constantly call the kids and he would say, oh, you know, I'm going to buy you such nice things for Christmas. And the kids were kind of growing up, especially Kevin, and he had been down this road before with his father where his father would promise him big, expensive and lavish gifts. And, and Kevin and his brother and sister just kind of overhearing these same excuses all the time from their father. So when Tony did call, they didn't really talk to their father at all. And he started to notice that they were kind of drifting away and not interested in their father. And this upset him a lot. And little did Debbie know that the money from the Constantia house, which they sold, was being used to pay off some of the debt that Tony had run up. In the new home that Tony and Debbie were staying in, they were not paying rent at all. And they had also not paid for the new school year. They had also not bought any clothes for the school year, stationery or anything to prepare for the new term. When the children did return back from Durban, Tony was ecstatic to see them and he then took them on an expensive shopping trip. And even though he was already in such financial debt, Debbie and the children didn't know. And he then went and spent 2,500 Rand on a sound system for his son Kevin and he bought Caitlin and Craig some other toys as well. Then on Wednesday the 16th of January 2002, the children were enjoying their last couple of days of the school holidays. Kevin had arranged for a friend to come over so that they could listen to his new sound system. 
Caitlin had arranged to sleep over at a friend's house and Tony did drop Caitlin off to sleep over at his friend's house but then he fetched her a couple of hours later to bring her home and told her to clean her room. So Caitlin and Kevin just ended up playing board games for the rest of that night and then at around 9pm all of the children were sent to bed. Debbie then went into their room and kissed all of them goodnight and she then decided to head over to sleep as well. According to Debbie she said that Tony acted completely normal that day as well as that evening. Then as the night goes on, Debbie then gets up early hours of the morning at around five o'clock in the morning because she needed the toilet. She then finishes her business in the toilet and then she heads back to her bedroom where she falls back asleep. But the next time that Debbie woke up, she would be in a hospital room. Debbie does not remember Tony coming into their bedroom and hitting her with an ax. Eventually, when Debbie was able to speak later on, she did have a very vague recollection of a shadow over her bed. Doctors would later say that Debbie had drawn a description of a man with an axe during her very early days of recovery. And often when Debbie was in the recovery bed and a male nurse who had the same build as Tony, when he would come into the hospital ward, Debbie's heart rate would escalate and rise very quickly, even though she was heavily sedated. What happened that night was that Tony had entered Debbie's bedroom and he had then hit her three times in the head with an axe. The first blow to Debbie's head had knocked her unconscious and then Debbie would later go on to describe that she heard very loud banging and she had this ominous feeling inside her body but she was unable to move. Tony then moved into Kevin's bedroom where he then proceeded to also hit Kevin three times with an axe. He then moved on to Caitlin's room, did the exact same thing and he then moved on to the smallest child's room, Craig, where he did the exact same thing. Tony then walked back to Kevin's room. He then wrapped Kevin up in his duvet. He then went to Caitlin's room. He did the same thing, wrapped her up, as well as Craig. He then collected all three of his children and he placed them into the study. He then put Kevin's body first on the floor. He then put Caitlin on top of Kevin and then Craig on top of Caitlin. Tony then gathered all of his documents, his family photos, albums, newspaper clippings, anything. He then put all of the stacks of paper strategically on his children. He then poured petrol all over them. He then walked to his garage, put the petrol canister back exactly where he found it. And then between half past six and seven a.m. in the morning, Tony then proceeded to light a match and throw the match on his three children. Tony then took a gun that he had in his study and he then shot himself in the head, dying instantly. However, sadly, the autopsy that was done on the children at a later date would show that they were still alive at the time that the match was thrown on them, and this was because they had smoke in their lungs at the time of their death. A couple of minutes later, firefighters did arrive at the Marina de Gama house that the family was in. They were alerted to a fire, and also neighbours stopped them to say that they heard gunshots, and the reason they heard gunshots was, one, because Tony had shot himself in the head, but because of the heat, he had left a box of bullets near his body, but then the heat of the fire had then caused these bullets to set themselves off. When the fire department got there and they heard the neighbours saying that they heard gunshots, the fire department thought that this was a murder by shooting. And they still believed this even when they went into Debbie's room because they saw the state that Debbie was lying in and they thought that Debbie had been shot in the head. And the reason they thought that she had been shot in the head was because the top half of her skull was not there. And firefighters did believe that Debbie had passed away, but when they started to move her, Debbie moved, and Debbie started to wake up, and when she saw the firefighter leaning over her, she then tried to protect herself and fight back. And this was a very weak attempt to fight back. She was very weak, she was very fragile, but she did try. The actions that the firefighters took in those first moments most likely saved Debbie's life because they immediately then put oxygen over her mouth as one of those oxygen masks in order to, I assume, to prevent more brain damage from the loss of oxygen. They also then put gauze over her head to keep it clean because they had soaked it in some kind of liquid to sterilize it. So they wrapped the gauze over the exposed brain tissue and then Debbie was airlifted to hospital. While Debbie was being airlifted to hospital, the first responders who were at the scene, they then went to investigate the rest of the house. They started off by going into the children's room and that's where they realized that something horrific had happened. Once the fire was completely extinguished, the three bodies of the children and Tony were taken to the labs in order to be forensically tested. Initially, police thought that the crime had been committed by intruders and this was just a burglary gone horribly wrong. But like the firefighters believed initially that this was a murder by shooting, the police did notice that the blood spatter was not consistent with a gun 
and they were looking for a very sharp and heavy object. Police also kind of debunked their own theory that this was an intruder because they noticed that the police had to break through heavy padlocks and lots of rings and rings of chain around a gate in order to get into the household first. So this couldn't have been an intruder. They later found that Tony had put rings and rings of chain around the fence and then padlocked everywhere he could in order to prevent his children or his wife from escaping and in order to delay the first responders from saving his family. Debbie remained in a coma for weeks and her parents flew down the night after this incident happened to be with her. But doctors really believed that there was not much hope for Debbie. She had lost a lot of brain matter and she was severely injured. But eventually, as time went on, doctors stopped making predictions because Debbie kept proving them wrong. And, and every milestone that doctors said, oh, she's probably not going to make it past this point, Debbie proved them wrong, she made it past there, and she had exceeded all of their expectations. A memorial service was held for the children while Debbie was in a coma, and after the memorial service, the children were cremated. Debbie said that when she initially came out of the coma, she thought that she had been in a car accident. And as soon as she was able to talk, she asked about her children and she asked about Tony. But everyone kind of went silent and they were all just looking awkwardly around the room. And eventually someone stood up and said, sadly, your children have been murdered by your husband and you were also attacked by your husband. And sadly, your children have not made it. Debbie then described feeling incredibly angry and shouting that she wants to see Tony now. And then someone also piped up and said, but Tony took his own life. And Debbie said that after she heard this, she just lay there absolutely dumbstruck. Debbie was incredibly depressed and she thought about her children non-stop, day in and day out. And she was still struggling to come to grips with what had happened. But Debbie pushed and she refused to die for her children's sake. Debbie was almost completely paralyzed, but she refused to lie there and just waste away. She knew that the children had lost their lives, but she was determined to not give Tony that satisfaction. So only weighing 39 kilograms, Debbie started her path of extremely painful physiotherapy and eventually after she had gone through physiotherapy for months she was able to slowly start walking again and eventually after years she has gained almost all of the mobility back except for the left side of her body she said it really doesn't work well to this day and as people started to hear what Tony Adlington had done everyone kind of started digging and wanting to do their own research about how far in debt Tony really was and apparently Debbie's parents had found out that Tony was stealing money out of the tuck shop that Debbie was running at the children's school and Debbie knew about this so in order to try and stop her husband from doing this she then opened a secret bank account which Tony eventually found out and then he started writing fake checks, forging her signature from this account until the account was completely depleted and there was no money left. And to make matters even worse, Tony Adlington apparently had four aliases that he would use and Debbie had no idea if Tony Adlington was even his real name. But back to Debbie, and because there was no money at all, Debbie then decided to move back in with her parents and obviously this was a little bit difficult for her because she had been living away from her parents for years. So Debbie was incredibly depressed in Durban while living with her parents and this was obvious from what she had been through but she said that the psychologist that she had seen in Durban was a person that was very dear to her because the psychologist helped her to not take her own life. Debbie would eventually move back to Cape Town and find a job that would make her very happy. Then around a year after the murders had taken place, Debbie really wanted to have a memorial service of her own because she missed the first memorial service for her children. So the children's ashes were still at the funeral home waiting for Debbie to collect them. And Debbie chose very close family and friends to witness this memorial service with her. And after the memorial service, Debbie and her family and friends then went to Takai Forest in order to scatter her children's ashes. And she scattered them in Takai Forest because this is where her children love to play and they were often at their happiest there. After the memorial service and scattering her children's ashes in Takai Forest, Debbie had this overcoming sensation that she really needed to be a mother again. So with the approval of this, her psychologists and her doctors, they said there's no reason that she can't have children. But there was one reason stopping her from having children because she wasn't in a relationship. She needed sperm in order to have a baby. So she went to a Cape Town fertility clinic where she then had a sperm donor. And after many attempts at the Cape Fertility Centre, she had finally fallen pregnant. Debbie then gave birth to a daughter named Kylie on the 12th of November 2005. Debbie always lets Kylie know how much she is loved and about her siblings and what happened to her in the past. 
Debbie wants Kylie to know about her brothers and sisters and wants to talk to Kylie about them. Debbie also regularly goes to Takai Forest to spend some time silently just thinking about her children and what had happened. Debbie says she has forgiven her husband for what he did to her because she survived, but she could not forgive him for what he did to her children. Currently, Debbie works as a motivational speaker and wants to share her story with others and tries to stop this from happening again and tries to also help people who are in need. Some people may speculate that Tony Adlington did it because he was mentally ill and one day it all came crashing down. Others say it's maybe because he suffered from PTSD from the military and his time on the border and in Zimbabwe. Or was it his financial debt, the fact that Debbie wanted to leave, and the fact that he didn't want all of his children in the beginning. But maybe it all just came crashing down and that's why he did what he did. But in the end, it's inexcusable. And that is the case of the Adlington murders. Let me know what you think down below if you have ever heard of this case before and what you think. Please stay safe out there. Make sure you don't talk to strangers. And I'll see you again next week. Bye.